Um, so thank you so much for joining us at the Legatum Institute. Um, we're delighted to have you here with us. Um, my name is Shelley Hartland and I'm Director of Cultural Transformation for the Institute. Um, just a quick show of hands, who has been to an event here before? Ah, good turnout. And congratulations to all the newbies and thank you for coming this evening. Um, for those who are new to our work, um, our mission is to create pathways from poverty to prosperity for individuals, communities and nations through open economies, empowered people and inclusive societies. Um, if you'd like to find out more about what we do, do you take one of our About Us documents, which is at the back, or just chat to anyone with an LI pin on? Um, so as part of our inclusive society's work, we run my favorite bit of our work here, which is the Road to Character Lecture Series, where we ask people we admire um, to speak on a character trait that they value. And tonight, I am delighted to introduce Baroness O'Neill, um, who has chosen to speak on trustworthiness, um, and specifically, why does trustworthiness matter more than trust, um, which I'm looking forward to hearing about. Um, we're really honored to have her with us, and for those unfamiliar with her work, I'm gonna run through um, a little bit of a bio. Though, as um, Onora was saying to me um, upstairs, actually, that's just a few of the things I've done. Mostly, it's been writing, teaching, studying, um, but they don't come across um, just as well in a list. So she completed a doctorate at Harvard University with John Rawls as her supervisor. Um, very impressive. Um, she is a, and now I've got to try and pronounce this correctly, emeritus. Emeritus? Emeritus. Um, emeritus Professor of Philosophy at the University of Cambridge, a former president of the British Academy, and chaired the Nuffield Foundation. She was founding president of the British Philosophical Association, principal of Newnham College, Cambridge, and was chair in the Equality and Human Rights Commission until 2016. Um, the Baroness's work has earned her numerous honors and awards, including um, the Begruen Prize and the Holberg Prize, and she became a crossbench peer in the House of Lords in 1999. Um, she is more than qualified to speak on trustworthiness, having written extensively on this topic for, I think, about 20 years. Um, so we're delighted to now welcome to the stage Baroness O'Neill. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, thank you all for turning out after, I'm sure, many busy days uh, for what will be a pretty short lecture, I promise that much. Um, Trustworthiness is, I think, more basic than trust, and I will say why. And yet, if you look around, you'll discover that there's far more discussion of trust than of trustworthiness. In fact, if you Google the two words, you'll find that the number of entries under trust is enormous, many, many millions. Trustworthiness is a bit less popular. But surely all of us think that trust is only worth having and only worth placing if it's intelligently directed to trustworthy claims and trustworthy action. So I think it's very important to be able to judge who is trustworthy and to be able to place and refuse our trust intelligently. We need evidence in short, and often it can be useful and sometimes actually essential to have that sort of boring evidence that's quantitative, systematic, and accessible. But the evidence we need most, I think, bears on ethical and epistemic standards, epistemic having to do with knowledge, um, and in particular, I think, honesty, competence, and reliability are the things that people are looking for when they're trying to work out where to place and where to refuse trust. And after all, we do want to place it well because getting it wrong can be pretty costly. Um, I think that if we think a bit about misplaced trust, we see one set of reasons why it's costly. Think of the well-known Mr. Madoff who made off with lots of people's money. <laughs> Would it have been better if more people had trusted him? No way. And equally, misplaced mistrust has heavy costs because then one is wrongly suspicious of somebody or some institution. I think a more interesting question is, is it harder to judge trustworthiness than it used to be? Uh, people often say there's a crisis of trust. And in some ways, I wish I hadn't called my wreath lectures, uh, the book is called A Crisis of Trust, but I do have a question mark on it. <laughs> uh, actually, 
The trust that people place in products, in persons, in institutions, all of them depend on judging trustworthiness, and it can always be quite difficult. The easy cases, of course, are the ones we know, the ones we're familiar with, uh, where you're dealing with a situation or an interlocutor with whom you are in, or with which you are entirely familiar. Um, the contact is direct, maybe it's frequent, you can judge it. There are lots of examples. And uh, I give you a, a, a simple example. I'm going to cross the road. There's someone driving along in my direction. He could put his foot on the accelerator and mow me down. Well, he could, but I make a reasonable judgment and I trust him not to do that. And in the main, I'm right. I give it a little birth, as we all do. Um, <laughs> and, of course, there are people who decide for whatever reason, and I, th I think it's quite an interesting pathology, that they will trust nobody and trust nothing that's pretty difficult, particularly in complicated cases. But we do have lots of cases every day for which we're competent to make the judgment. I place my trust there, I refuse my trust there. There are cases, maybe, where we think, I'm not at all certain, but I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. For example, consider some of you may know people who have had problems with their children taking drugs. And I've heard people say things like, but if I don't trust him, no one will. And it's so important to do that, although they've been let down and the evidence is not very good. Now, the evidence in many other cases isn't everyday evidence. It's complex evidence. It's chains of evidence. It's indirect evidence. We interact today with more people of whom we have little knowledge and evidence reaches us by very complex routes. By, and of course, it reaches us by institutional structures. We have little oversight sometimes. There are multiple links. And that can indeed make judging trustworthiness harder. Broadly, and this is the only little bit of philosophical jargon I'll allow myself, I will quote a famous philosopher in a moment. Broadly, I think, uh, what we find ourselves trying to do when we're judging what people say and the undertakings they make, we're trying to judge their speech acts, not the content of those speech acts. Um, end of philosophical jargon. Um, now, indirectness is, of course, nothing new, but problems have often arisen, and they've arisen recently, because we have had changing technologies for communication. And I think that the uh, large disruptive changes in what are called, or you may say not quite accurately called, communication technologies in our day have made it harder to judge trustworthiness. And it's particularly evident when things are changing fast. So now to quote one philosopher, well, I won't quote him, I'll summarize what he said. Plato. Um, Plato... Uh, reports to us, he was writing, but he reports to us that his mentor Socrates didn't do writing because he didn't think it was trustworthy. This very interesting claim that is being made uh, 400 years before the birth of Christ, and it's being made in the dialogue called Phaedrus. And uh, Socrates says uh, that the trouble is that when you have the written word, you don't know where it's come from. Uh, you don't know to whom it should speak, is the way he puts it. He suggests that we simply can't tell. Try to imagine the situation. There you are in uh, ancient Greece, and you're walking along, and you see an inscription on a rock. You can't read. Very few people could. You think, what's that? Who put it there? Whose is it? Is it a spell? Is it a curse? Is it for me? Is it for someone else? Writing was often not much trusted. And what is interesting is that writing came to be very much trusted because it leaves an enduring trace. Unlike the spoken word, 
which until modern technologies were spoken and was gone, the written word can be kept. You can have permanent records, as we say. Um, but that wasn't the only crisis. The next crisis arose with the invention of printing in the, uh, the early modern period. And printing, of course, allows you to produce multiple copies. Uh, and uh, again, you lose track of where did it come from? Whose words am I reading? And it took, surprisingly, I think, or at least it, it seems surprising to us, it took a couple of centuries to sort out uh, the ways by which people could judge the printed word. Uh, copyright dates to 1710, the Statute of Anne. But uh, copyright, of course, wasn't always respected internationally. When Charles Dickens did his lecture tour in the US in, I think, the 1840s, uh, he uh, found that American printers were busy printing his books, plagiarizing, as we would say, and selling them because uh, he was doing such wonderful advertisements for them. Later, copyright was internationalized, but I'm sure many of you have been to jurisdictions, as I have myself, where copyright is not respected, and you don't know where it comes from. And by and large, the printed word came to be seen as wonderful for providing a permanent record and uh, a record that was traceable. And similar innovations were introduced when broadcasting came along. So each technological innovation introduced different intermediaries whose work was essential if people were to judge the trustworthiness of the words they encountered. But there were also successive remedies. Remedies typically work in, by establishing accountable intermediaries who oversee the relevant activity. For print, those remedies took a long time. But when you begin to think about the detail that's involved, if any of you are in publishing, you'll know all about this, you've got to distinguish the roles of the author, the editor, the printer, the publisher, the bookseller. You've got to require these but different roles to be identifiable by the person who buys a book. You've got to introduce copyright, imprints, set legal requirements like uh, prohibitions on defamation, prohibitions on uh, uh, stealing intellectual property. You've got to introduce curation and culture. There are numerous standards that are relevant. In short, accountability has been secured by a combination of legislation, regulation, and above all, regulation of intermediaries and then it's been fine-tuned by making demands for certain cultures and character. So we have seen a lot of legislation, regulation, accountability, and codes of practice. And I also have to say, in the end, also good sense. More care, more honesty, more accuracy is what it takes, we think. But do these remedies work? Or do they produce complexity that defeats the very aim of the exercise and defeats those of us who are trying to work out whether to place or refuse trust? Sometimes they do work. Think about copyright. Think about financial audit. It works, sort of, up to a point. Think about publishing basic statistics about something that is useful in an accessible form. For example, weather forecasts. But sometimes remedies have been introduced that do not secure or even help trustworthiness. For, here are some examples of failures. People have sometimes introduced excessively complicated terms and conditions and asked people to consent to those terms and conditions. They've introduced complex metrics. Those of you who have a foot in the academic world will be able to think of the uh, research assessment exercise now, the REF, and just wait till the TEF, the Teaching Excellence Framework, comes along. Um, they, and sometimes they just make it so difficult for the users. Um, some years ago, I was on a, a small 
committee that looked into the safety of maternity services in England and Wales. So we took a lot of evidence from a lot of midwives and it was very interesting. But the thing that I remember most clearly was the midwife who said, you know, the trouble is it takes longer to do the paperwork than to deliver the baby. <laughs> Perfect. That is exactly the sort of way of uh, securing accountability that we don't want. And I think you will, all of you have met perverse incentives, things that lead to the gaming of certain activities, and I think that things have got more difficult recently. So now I'm going to talk about digital technologies. The initial assumption was that these technologies were going to improve communication. Think of the writing of 20 to 25 years ago in the infancy of the digital revolution. And uh, I think frequently about Mark Zuckerberg's well-known and uh, I think very regrettable uh, uh, slogan, move fast and break things. Now, trying to give a charitable interpretation, I think what he was thinking was, let's get rid of the old intermediaries because they stand between people and things they want to know. So all this business about editors and, and uh, for newspapers, it can go directly to the reader. And his thought was the intermediaries are obstacles to good communication, or maybe they're obstacles to individual choice. So get rid of the intermediaries. And uh, of course, that was a view taken by very many people a few years ago, not least among them, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who uh, fought hard to keep the World Wide Web accessible to all. But what I think has not been remarked is that um, the new intermediaries were introduced. And I believe that that failure to consider the new intermediaries and their interests and what they may be doing to damage trustworthiness has had a, a bad effect. Uh, we are allowing the new intermediaries, I'll tell you who they are in a moment, to wrap themselves in a cloak of anonymity, which of course means that you and I and everybody else can't actually tell who is doing what because it's not told. This is not, in my view, particularly a problem with social media, although people uh, are very worried about social media and I do understand why. Uh, and social media are, in my view, an Im quite an important source of what uh, would be called, I think by any economist, private harms. Uh, so that things like cyberbullying or trolling uh, or, or you know, um, fraud, these are all private harms done by new technologies or facilitated trolling. However, I'm more interested in the public harms that we are seeing, which are, I think, above all, damage to public discourse, damage to media standards, damage to culture, and damage to democracy. And the latter is the one I'm most worried about. Um, and they are mainly a consequence of the new intermediaries created by the business models used by the big tech companies. So what are the problems with digital intermediaries and how do they damage trustworthiness and our ability to judge trust? I think what they do is to allow powerful players anonymity, making it once again, just like in Plato's day, hard to tell who is doing what, and even what is being done. Uh, we know now that the Trump election campaign of 2016 and the Brexit referendum got a bit of attention of this sort, but those were early days, and we don't know, and it's constantly being pointed out by those who don't think there's a serious problem, it, um, we don't know how much harm was done. But things have changed. The Department of Culture, Media and Sport Select Committee published an interesting report in the spring uh, under the title um, Fake News and Disinformation, or maybe it was Disinformation and Fake News. Uh, they 
unearthed rather put into the public domain, rather more evidence about the Cambridge Analytica scandal uh, than had been unearthed by the Californian court. Rather, the Californian court uh, didn't put it in the public domain, whereas our select committee did. Um, but I think the problem is uh, that now far more developed. Uh, there's a very recent report by the Oxford Internet Institute with the slightly alarming title Cyber Troops. Um, I think it's one of a series of reports under that title, which is about uh, the um, online control of uh, these technologies uh, by persons whom we and businesses and states whom we cannot identify. So just a bit on the problems that we face with digital intermediaries. And what I find interesting here is it's not so different from the problems Plato was thinking about. You can't trace the provenance. They allow powerful players anonymity. They make it hard or impossible to tell who's doing what, and often enough, even what's being done. The Trump election campaign was a good example. Now, for some time, I believed, naive as I was, that the remedy would surely be to treat these companies as publishers. And uh, it seemed that if they had to meet the same standards as publishers, rather than saying, we are platforms on which all the world can post stuff and we're not publishers, uh, that would be a remedy. I fear, and uh, Timothy Garton Ash convinced me of this, I fear it is not a remedy. The amount of content uh, that uh, can be examined by a publisher is pretty limited. I mean, maybe you publish a lot of books, but you don't publish the amount of content that flows through the platforms. So it seems to me that the remedy of saying, uh, would you please be a publisher is not open to us. There's also a problem, a jurisdictional problem, in that many of these players are located in jurisdictions that they could very well leave, and some of them are uh, pretty fleet of foot. Uh, there is a reason why, for example, Amazon is headquartered in Luxembourg and Google in Dublin, and the reason has largely to do with minimizing their taxation. They make their money with their sales, of course, to, in Germany and the UK, but they're not located or taxed here. So I don't think that remedy, though it would be a good remedy if, if feasible is not, uh, will work. So what can be done, and this is the question I hope we can discuss, if the digital, digital providers can't carry the responsibilities of publishers and jurisdictional limitations make it very unlikely that they can be required to do so. The new intermediaries have enormous power, enormous wealth, uh, and they have the cloak of anonymity hiding what they do from citizens and individuals. Now, uh, the sheer difficulty of regulation is leading some people to suggest, could we put more weight on codes? I'm not against codes. I think codes are useful. But let us remember what happened in the 1980s during the Thatcher administration uh, when it was a popular mantra that professions were a conspiracy against the public. And you can have a very nice profession, medical profession, for example, or accountants, high standards, but uh, enforcement is very difficult for a professional body. So I think we are in a difficult position. We're on a cusp where change is urgently needed, but it's barely begun. Even diagnosis is incomplete. Some things may be remediable. I think that the private harms issue, that's to say the cyber bullying and the and fraud and so on, is probably remediable because the tech companies have an interest in getting that right. Um, I don't know how much they'll do, but uh, they certainly have moved away from saying uh, no regulation for us. They say now that they do need regulation. I'm sure they mean regulation that suits us. However, I think there will be movement there because you don't earn a good commercial reputation by inflicting these private harms on some of your customers. 
But what about the public harms? Do these companies have any interest in limiting the public harms? The problem we have, I think, to face is that the profits they obtain by marketing ads covertly, because that is their business, uh, the social media are merely the conduit by which they get data and transmit data. But do they have any interest in restricting their marketing of ads, even when this damages public goods and even when it undermines democracy? And I'm sorry to have given you a pessimistic talk. Yeah. <laughs>